Western Leadership Lab now coming to you uh, via the magic of the uh, uh, the Zoom meeting uh, portal. Uh, this is a really uh, timely and important one. Uh, a conversation about climate change, climate ad adaptation, and how those issues might play out in the COVID-19 era. Uh, I'm Kareem Bardisi. I'm the executive director and co-founder of the Ryerson Leadership Lab. We're an action-oriented think tank at Ryerson, working at the intersection of leadership and public policy and uh, pleased to host conversations like this. This one is including many, many of the members of our Making the Future class, uh, CSH 505, uh, through the Chang School of Continuing Education and the, uh, and the Ryerson Faculty of Arts. Um, thanks so much for joining. We've got um, until five o'clock exactly. Chris has uh, generously offered some of his time um, from his reporting uh, schedule and also his uh, family holiday. Um, and many of us are observing or about to observe holidays for the next few days. And I want to thank you for taking some of your time with us today. Um, we'll have um, Famida uh, Kamali, our manager of operations, will take us through some of the uh, modalities of today's conversation. Then we'll hear from, from Chris, and then we'll go straight to uh, Q&A. Awesome. Thanks, Kareem. We will be using Slido to gather questions from the, the participants here. So if you visit fli.do and use the code RLL4, you can ask questions anonymously or you can associate your name with it. Um, and then once questions are on the platform, folks can vote up the questions that are the most interesting to them. And when Kareem is moderating, he'll go through the questions in order of popularity. Thanks, thanks very much, Famita. And uh, a brief introduction to Christopher. Christopher is uh, the climate ad adaptation reporter from the New York Times, uh, formerly of Bloomberg News and uh, ProPublica and the big money. Um, a now defunct uh, but uh, much beloved Slate business publication uh, and uh, before then had a career in uh, uh, politics and communications and public policy in Canada. Um, Christopher has been reporting on, um, on climate change for a number of years now and has really specialized, uh, carved out a, a place that didn't seem maybe important to a lot of people but has clearly uh, shown its importance around uh, climate, climate adaptation in particular how communities make some really tough choices around how they uh, deal with the, um, uh, the climate change um, trends that are coming their way or the climate uh, disasters that have hit, afflicted them. And so I'm really glad to have Christopher to join us uh, to speak about, about those issues and other issues um, in a very different uh, time for us. Uh, so we'll uh, start with a few questions, a few remarks from Christopher and then we'll go uh, to your questions. Fantastic. All right, thanks. Uh... Thanks, Kareem, for having me, and uh, hello, everyone. Uh, so I'm just going to really briefly just just talk about what I what I cover, and then of course coronavirus stuff. Uh, I until about a month ago looked pretty squarely at at the question of how we respond to climate change, not in terms of cutting emissions, but in terms of um, of adapting uh, our, our businesses and our governments and our society to deal with the consequences of climate change, more storms, more flooding, higher temperatures, more droughts, et cetera. Uh, and um, that's gonna continue to be an issue. Um, there's no question about it. We are not, I think, meaningfully bending the curve yet on emissions. And so we'll have to keep dealing with the consequences. But, but the question I think of the moment is pretty clearly coronavirus. Uh, and so I'll offer some quick thoughts uh, and then really what I'm most excited about is taking questions and hearing what's on people's minds. Um, the, I think the, the useful way of looking at the coronavirus climate change intersection right now is uh, there's what's going to happen and what is happening during sort of the height of the virus, but probably the more important question is what will happen around climate change once, once the crisis subsides. Uh, once we get to the other side of the peak. So right now, clearly the most obvious thing is emissions are down, right? No one's leaving their house, almost no one's leaving their house. Uh, people aren't driving, there's less economic activity, there's less production. Uh, so lots of the sources of emissions have slowed down. So I'm sure that when we get to the end of this year, we'll see a meaningful dip in global greenhouse gas emissions, certainly for developed countries that are taking the social distancing most seriously. Um, and that's, you know, on its face, that's that's, all else be equal, that's good for climate change. Uh, there's been some other issues going on right now. We've, my team at the Times has written about how federal agencies in the US uh, have used the coronavirus as an argument for relaxing some of the restrictions they face 
on pollution. And I think in other countries as well, that's the case. I think in Europe, airlines have said they want to break from uh, taxes on airline travel. Uh, and, and probably by itself, that will push back on the reduction. So it's, we don't know yet on balance how much the coronavirus, uh, it, the, the heat of it right now will reduce emissions, but somewhat. Uh, I think what matters is how much of that lasts, right? Will people, when this all passes, whether it's in three months or six months or a year or whatever, uh, will more people work from home? Uh, will more people uh, want to live in less dense areas? You can imagine a world where uh, density loses its appeal, which would hurt climate trends. You can imagine a world where there's sort of a lingering fear of public transit still, and which would hurt climate trends. Uh, and I, I, I'm speculating, but you can imagine a world where if there's a recession that lasts for a long time, for years, and is really severe, which looks like it could be the case, maybe climate change will lose uh, its, um, its, its hold on the public consciousness. I mean, maybe governments and voters will say, we were worried about climate change and that's still a problem, but you know, we're more worried about this. So let's just, let's, let's not talk about sacrifice right now. We've got enough sacrifice. So the, the appetite for the kind of hard changes that will be required uh, to really bend the emissions curve down, that appetite could, could go away or at least diminish. Uh, we don't know everything, you know, this is all speculation right now. Um, but I would just, you know, the, the one thing I'd note is again, there's what's happening right now, but probably what matters is what happens once, once hospitals have calmed down, once we're not staring at huge, huge death rates. And then we say, well, what does our new world look like? And, and the big question will be, how does climate change fit into our new world post coronavirus? And I think you could make not, not, too, not too bad a case that says, climate change will seem less important. I just got a note and then I'll, I'll take questions. Um, the other side of that is, and climate activists have, have made this argument. I'm not sure how convincing it is. The other side is people will say, hey, look what just happened. We, we've just seen evidence that we have to get ahead of crises before they get a hand, right? Which applies to climate change. We've got to build up our resilience before it's tested, which applies to climate change. We've got to invest in, you know, uh, local food production and hospitals and all the kinds of things, all kinds of investments that would have helped with coronavirus and, and would loosely help with climate change or adaptation. But, you know, who knows, right? The, the, the sort of the public consciousness and the public view on climate change is so malleable and seems to swing back and forth a lot. It, it's... I'd like, I'd like to think that people will respond to this by saying, what other threats are we missing? Is climate change one of them? Probably. Do we do more about it? I don't know. People have, someone said to me today, a, a sort of a, a finite capacity for worry. And if too much of that capacity is taken by coronavirus, in theory, the part that's left for climate change goes away. So, so that's what I'm watching and that's what we'll see more of in the next few months. But I'd, I'd honestly, I'd love to hear Kareem, what, what your folks have on their minds and what I can discuss about that. A absolutely. And may maybe can I just take a um, peg, a, um, peg off some of the things you said with the first question uh, around what, what kind of reporting are you doing right now and what, what are you hearing from people who are in the space um, uh, who, who, who spend all their time thinking about this, and especially in the United States? What are, they, what are they saying? So a lot of my reporting right now is so in the U.S., the Federal Emergency Management Agency, FEMA, is both in charge of dealing with natural disasters and has also been tasked to lead the coronavirus response. So I'm spending a lot of my time looking at how, how well it can do that. Um, we've, people who watch this stuff have noticed in the last few years we've had a string of terrible disasters in the U.S. And the U.S. disaster management system isn't great to begin with, isn't super well resourced. Uh, and so it has struggled and now it's going to struggle more because we're going into hurricane season starting June 1st. Uh, and so FEMA has uh, sent a lot of its people and resources to all these uh, hotspots, the coronavirus, and I think they're going to struggle to deal with whatever storms or floods or tornadoes or whatever comes up. 
So I, I look at that, but I, you know, it doesn't, it, that doesn't have a, a lot of bearing on the broader question of, you know, are we going to, will our views change? I've just, I've just begun looking into this question of how will public opinion change in response to the coronavirus, public mm -hmm. opinion on climate change. And of course we can look at sort of loose analogies, right? There was the financial crisis that was worse in this country than in Canada. And my sense is that people uh, reported less concern about climate change during that crisis. But at the same time, uh, political leaders, Democrats pushed hard uh, for climate measures even in the midst of that crisis. So we don't really have a great analogy to tell us how sort of the body politic will respond to this around climate change. Uh, it probably depends a little bit on how bad it is. I mean, if you keep getting gigantic increases in unemployment every two weeks, I don't know how much room that leaves to focus on climate change, but uh, you know, in theory, it doesn't have to be one or the other. You can, you can do long-term and short-term threat at the same time, but in reality, it's hard to focus on different things. Um, and I should just note in reference to one of the things you mentioned, uh, uh, Christopher has been uh, reporting from Washington, D.C. for the last decade or so, uh, but based from there has um, been to a lot of these disaster hotspots. And it sounds like you're giving us a warning that uh, if the usual um, trajectory of floods and hurricanes uh, comes this spring, that those communities that are facing that uh, could hit a double could be faced with a, a, a kind of a double whammy. They might be already compromised by COVID. Um, uh, they maybe can't muster their emergency response. And then they've also maybe won't have as much uh, support from the federal management, uh, emergency management officials. It, it's a big problem. It's a big concern. And I don't, I don't wanna, um, I don't wanna uh, speak ill or appear to speak ill of US disaster officials. They do a good job, they work hard. Just a question of bandwidth right? You, it's hard to see how we can have, as they say, a 50 state emergency and also be prepared for hurricanes and floods and wildfires. So no one, you know, like it's, it, this is such a cliche at this point, but like as with anything in climate change, no one planned for this, right? No one planned for the kinds of storms that the U.S. has had in the last three years and no one planned for having all that on top of something like a, a pandemic. So it's, uh, it's, it could well be a, a tough spring and summer. Um, I'll start getting some of the questions now from, from some folks. Um, uh, and this is a question we've heard about in Canada as well. Um, uh, given how many people are now unemployed or going to be unemployed, are there opportunities for governments to create jobs programs uh, dedicated to climate action? And do you have any insights from your prior reporting on what those programs might be? Yeah, I mean, so the, the big focus, of course, in the US, or one of the folks was this idea of a Green New Deal and, and which means a lot of things to a lot of people, but one of them could be, for example, uh, new infrastructure, uh, new renewable power production, uh, weatherizing homes. So people, I think, rightly point out that there's a ton of work that is to be done if the US or Canada wants to really get serious about reducing emissions and also preparing uh, for the effects of more storms and flooding. Um, you know, who knows, right? I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure that um, in normal times, the appetite for massive federal spending is not clear, right? Even, even in the financial crisis, the stimulus bill was, I think, $800 billion, and Republicans opposed it pretty fiercely. Uh, so, you know, would, would, the, would the different magnitude of the crisis this time create more consensus supporting, uh, you know, a massive jobs program that would have people working on climate projects? Maybe. Uh, I, I think, I don't know. My speculation is that there's still so much polarization around climate change that while Republicans might support a massive jobs bill in general with the goal of getting people back to work, they would probably be less supportive if there was a climate overlay saying, and also we're doing this to fight climate change. I would guess that would be a good way to, to kill support for that. Uh, so I'd, I'd be surprised if this leads to that kind of massive program. Okay, that's a really important insight to, as we follow the politics of this as well. Um, uh, a question uh, from one of our students, Jean-Luc Sac mouse uh, writes, many climate change activists are pushing the idea that while it's important to focus and fix the COVID pandemic, our global resources should still be put toward climate change uh, in tandem with uh, fighting the coronavirus. And so the question is, um, uh, 
can we do both of the, can we, should, uh, should, can we do one or the other, or can we do both at the same time? Part that's a fiscal policy issue. You have some experience yeah. with that too. I mean, look, of, of course, in theory, there's nothing mutually exclusive, right? You can, you can both have short-term policies to uh, increase the availability of testing, get more ventilators, deal with hospital expansion, get, you know, support people's income while they're out of work, help businesses hire them again. So sort of the, the one week to one month to six month thing for coronavirus and also keep pursuing policies to reduce emissions, like making cars more fuel efficient and finding ways to get power production uh, cleaner. Um, but I guess my sense, if you're an elected official is, you know, you can only push so many things at once. And I think that certainly for the Democrats in the US this year, they'll have to say, what do we want to run on? Already a tough question with coronavirus. I don't know. I mean, they, you know, this, this government and other governments might say, how much do we want to ask people? And how much do we want to ask of them that we don't have to? And they might say climate change, is one of those things that's really important, but we don't have to do it this year. And so maybe if we're going to risk alienating people uh, for coronavirus fixes, maybe we don't also want to alienate them for climate fixes. But in theory, it does not have to be exclusive. You're right. Um, I just don't know. I don't know how how risk averse politicians will respond to the new pressures of COVID, uh, and if they'll also really hang on to climate stuff as as a, a priority. Um, question from uh, Jean Francois Bergeon um, about the finan financial sector and climate change, and. Um, it's, it's a broad opportunity, I think, for you to talk about uh, where the finan where financial services fits into the climate uh, challenge, um, and especially maybe you could t talk about some of your reporting on um, insurance, the insurance sector. Um, uh, it's a broad question. You know, what is the what is the role of the, the financial sector can play in helping to uh, to help uh, address and fight uh, climate change? And maybe you can again speak to some of your reporting on this. It's it's a great question. Again, until a month or two ago, one of the most important, I think, themes in climate policy was this increasing shift uh, towards looking at, at lenders and financial actors as potentially part of the equation. And, and climate activists were shifting their attention, not so much away from governments, but adding, adding in their sort of focus area, big banks and saying, we want to pressure big banks to not lend to coal and oil projects and to lend more to renewable energy. I think they're, they're right that that is an important lever, right? That the decisions of lenders matter. And there was some movements. It, it was unclear, and I've written about this, and others have, it's unclear how significant the movement was, but there was movement. Uh, what happens now? I don't know, I don't know if sort of the Goldman Sachs and the JP Morgans of the world will still feel as much pressure uh, to, um, to show investors that they're moving on climate change. Maybe they will. I mean, these are different groups and, and part of it probably depends how, to what degree do climate activists still mobilize? Uh, is it gonna seem discordant to, you know, continue to treat climate change as the most important issue of our time when you've got, you know, thousands of people dying every day in the US and elsewhere? from coronavirus and, you know, what's the number? Millions and millions of Americans filing for unemployment. Uh, so yeah, I think certainly some of the public attention on financial institutions to act on climate change will recede because there's so much going on. Uh, so you could look at it as a fascinating test, right? Do those banks still push that hard if people aren't watching as much? Um, I, I don't know. I think I think it'll fall to regulators a little bit. Regulators have also been saying we want to push, especially in the in the UK, we want to push banks to take this risk more seriously. Um, so regulators can carry that weight. But obviously, I'm just I'm just um, in a roundabout way saying no one knows. But I think it's the right thing to watch, uh, and um, and and we'll see in a few months. And is it your is it your sense that um, that the action that the finance sector was taking was more due to political and public pressure than it was due to their bottom line pressures? I mean, who, who knows, right? They certainly say, oh no, we're not, we're not bending to activists. We are, we are taking these steps because we wanna be you know, prudent 
prudent watchdogs over our own investors' resources, and we think this is the right way to, to go. It probably didn't hurt that uh, divesting from coal, in some cases from oil sands, uh, dovetailed with the demands of activists. Um, but yeah, I mean, to the degree that, that it was in fact a prudent decision, then presumably they'll keep doing it, right? But then again, the landscape has changed so much. I don't, you know, I don't know if they know what a good investment will be in six months or a year. So again, all we know is that it's something to watch. Um, uh, question from, um, uh, uh Julia in the class, um, any, any assessments on what long-term behavioral impacts will come from COVID-19, um, uh, when it comes to the environment? I mean, you, you've observed some of the short-term effects, uh, any, any sense of, and again, what are the, the people you're maybe talking to saying or not saying? Yeah, again, that's, that's the question, right? If people are now not taking public transit to take one obvious example because they're afraid of getting infected will that persist that change in behavior persist uh, a year from now i mean in theory it shouldn't if i look at what little i know if if we get herd immunity and the threat of infection recedes then in theory you get uh, a return to pre-coronavirus levels but people are habit forming and so maybe there'll be sort of a taint that applies about transit, right? Same thing, and my, my colleague Emily Badger has made this point, same thing about density, right? The sort of, the, 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 the propensity to view urban density as an inherent good uh, with all kinds of beneficial spinoffs, maybe it will change, right? Mm -hmm. I live in sort of the quasi suburbs at the edge of DC, and uh, I sort of, thought that was a mixed blessing before all this, but now I think it's great because I got a backyard that my kids can play in. Uh, and I imagine others will also think, hey, maybe I don't want to be stuck in an apartment next time. Mm -hmm. So we don't know. Um, uh, food is another one, like apparently food waste is down. I don't know if that's a reliable thing, but you hear it. <laughs> if food waste is down and that continues and people remain sort of attentive to not throwing out food they don't eat, but just keeping it because it's hard to get new food, Maybe that's good for the environment. That would certainly be good for the environment if it continues. Does it continue? I, I have no idea. So we'll, we'll, we'll be watching that. A um, couple of questions um, from uh, on the Slido, and please use uh, Slido, S-L-I.D-O, code R-L-L-4, to put your questions. A um, couple of them re relating to narratives and uh, kind of the, the rhetoric around climate change right now during COVID. Uh, one of the ones that we're seeing a lot is especially this is being put forward by the activists. Look, if we could, look how fast we, we, we have moved on COVID-19, look at all these policy measures we've uh, uh, aggressively been able to come up with within days or weeks. Yeah. We could do the same on climate, like we can do the same on climate change. Yeah. Um, uh, is that a good narrative? Uh, are there better narratives? This is a question from Laura Hache, who's uh, one of our uh, collaborators at Youth Challenge International, a really good one. It's, it's, it's a, I think a totally valid point that we sure have made changes, many people have made changes in their daily routine that would have seemed, you know, to totally science fiction, right, two months ago. And we made them really fast. Uh, I think the, the important difference is people respond in a particular way to immediate and serious threats to their health and their family's health. And it's maybe hard to reproduce that. I'm not sure you'd want to reproduce that, right? So you could flip that and say, perhaps the only way people will make significant changes to their daily routine is if you scare them with the prospect of death, which probably isn't the way you want to pursue climate action, right? So I don't, I don't know how strong the analogy is. Certainly, the point is accurate that we've, we've, many of us, perhaps most of us, have shifted our daily routines in ways that would have seemed crazy before this. Whether that means we can move faster, I mean, certainly, like, certainly it's possible to, you know, stop driving cars real fast, right? And change the way we heat buildings real fast. Uh, and, you know, rapid change is, is easy if you have to do it, uh, mm -hmm. but it still costs a lot. So, I mean, I don't, don't know if that level of, of pressure and incentive mm -hmm. will ever apply for climate change. There was, you know, three years ago, four years ago, five years ago, you'd hear people say, you know, as soon as we get a series of really bad storms or floods or wildfires, 
Americans will pay attention. They'll believe it's real and they'll want to take action. Here we are after three years of serious storms and floods and wildfires in the U.S. It's not really clear to me that it's had any meaningful change that we're now willing to do things we wouldn't do previous. So I, I don't know. Uh, I, I, would, I would urge caution about just, just how applicable we think the lessons of coronavirus are to climate change in terms of people changing behavior. Could you speak to, because you've reported from a number of places, Louisiana, places in the Caribbean, the Carolinas, where it has been uh, uh, experienced as a matter of like serious personal safety. And presumably you've interviewed people uh, there who were not previously converts <laughs> uh, to climate action. What kind of words uh, do they use? What kind of language frames uh, do those who, who have uh, um, who are who have had to face it? How, how do they how do they talk about the issue? I mean, the thing you pick up talking to people in coastal Louisiana or or in southern Florida, um, two places that that you know can lean Republican, uh, but if it been really seriously impacted by climate change, is they don't, there's no dispute about climate change anymore. They might not talk about climate change per se, but no one's arguing over whether it's real. Uh, and yeah, there's, you see a shift in, you know, the European window uh, shifts and people are talking about manage retreat more and changes in how they build and where they build. So definitely the view of what is plausible response to events, especially severe events. Um, but uh you know, it snaps back as well. If you go somewhere that hasn't been hit by something for a long time, I mean, South Florida, again, is a classic example. People will say Hurricane Andrew in 92 really destroyed South Florida uh, or parts of it. Uh, but then there hasn't really been as severe a storm since then and people forget. So people are malleable in both directions. So I don't, you know, my view continues to be the, the, the change that matters probably is whether elected officials really want to take this on. Um, because voters will, it'll, it'll, it'll wax and wane. Have you seen, um, and on that, again, because you're in DC and you um, see and follow so much of, of this on the political side, are there any political journeys by individual or officials or, or, or factions that you found interesting, either presumably most, mostly towards being converted towards taking more action, uh, although perhaps I guess they could go in the other direction. Any, any, any lessons that come to mind is, uh, I, I think a lot of people uh, participating in this chat will want to be uh, persuading their own elected officials. <laughs> uh, what what uh, what matters to them? What makes them respond to incentives to 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 take more action? You you hear anecdotally that Republicans are shifting their view on climate change. Uh, motivations are probably a mix of things. One motivation I'm told is the desire not to look foolish. The, the sense that, well, it, it may have been plausible two years ago to say, I'm not a scientist, I don't think this, maybe this stuff isn't real. That doesn't fly anymore. You lose too many voters uh, by saying that. And so they're shifting slightly towards, okay, I'm not gonna dispute that this is happening, but let's talk about the solutions because I think I worry the solutions are really severe. So there's a shift there. I think, you know, as with any human, people are motivated by, by a desire not to look stupid or not to look at, not to be embarrassed right and i think there's always that sense on both sides on both sides you know what what is it that my supporters want to hear and what is it that they will punish me if they hear from me uh and so some shift but I, you know it's it seems marginal still i don't get the sense that republicans are about to embrace uh you know a, a serious price on carbon if any price on carbon uh, meaningful regulations or serious regulations on emitters, uh, more strenuous regulations on, on auto efficiency, et cetera. So I haven't personally noticed a lot of serious conversions uh, among elected officials, um, but uh, you know, they, they, they happen quietly. And so maybe it's still going on, I don't know. Um, a question uh, from Reem. Um Youth can, um, uh, and in the, in the States, you have the Sunrise Movement, which has been pretty influential, uh, can make a lot of um, uh, difference on climate change. What, are, what have you seen uh, that's been especially effective, uh, I guess, politically or in the communities you've covered or on the policy issues that you've uh, been covering where uh, there, a youth voice has been especially uh, effective or influential? 
effective in this context, meaning pushing change or what? Yeah, either either uh, uh, elevating uh, the priority of an issue um, or perhaps a, a part of the agenda. Uh, I mentioned the Sunrise Movement. You've also got the Green New Deal, which um, uh, you'd, you'd be aware of in terms of some of the solutions. Uh, is there a particular aspect where, where youth have been effective, uh, again, maybe in the States? You know, I, I don't know, but certainly the, like, the Greta, the Greta movement got such attention uh, and how you would measure its effectiveness, I'm not really sure, but mm -hmm. if, if, if one measure of effectiveness is prominence, uh, it made the topic unavoidable for a while. Um, I, I, you know, I, it's hard to know because it wasn't clear to me that, it remains unclear to me that youth protests around climate change in the US or Canada have really specific goals mm -hmm. as opposed to the goal of take this seriously. And in the absence of specific goals, it's hard to really gauge whether they are affecting any change. Mm -hmm. uh, so, um, I mean, the, the people I like, my part of the climate beat, I talk to emergency managers, I talk to insurance industry people, I talk to people in building. Uh, and they are all responding to physical risk and financial risk. Uh, and they're not so much responding to protesters. Yeah. Uh, so I don't know, I don't know if that is going to be a big avenue of change. I wonder if to the degree that climate action is spurred by public demand, I wonder if it might be people saying, I'm a homeowner and I don't want to see the value of my home collapse, or I'm a homeowner and I don't want to see my home flooded. Uh, and so that sort of, that kind of parochialism might produce more right. change than, than people in the street marching. I don't know though. And, and for those of us on the, uh, um, uh, a lot of the folks, uh, I think including me, and unless I was, um, when I'm not reading your, your, your stuff, wouldn't necessarily know, um, but I, I do get your alerts. So I'm uh, uh, Christopher Hillel on the New York Times. Uh, has, his, he has Chris has his own uh, author page. And so you will get a full policy briefing if you subscribe to the uh, climate alerts um, that New York Times puts out. What, what are some of those like sort of ideas in the space, the policy ideas in the spaces that you cover that, that can make a real difference? Uh, you've mentioned um, the emergency management, you've mentioned flooding. Um, what are the what are the good ideas that are are there to be taken that can really make a difference? Well, I mean, like the 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 tension that I follow most closely is this question of where and how do we build, right? So if you look at if you if you group possible climate action or climate policies based on how much effect they're going to have on people in the near term, cutting emissions obviously quite meaningful, but little effect in the near term. Whereas where and how we build has a massive effect. I wrote a piece about Canada last summer noting that many provinces, including Quebec, have a policy of discouraging people from rebuilding after a flood in the same spot where they built before. Uh, and it just, that is, that remains anathema in the U.S. The notion of telling someone they can't rebuild their house is, is radical. But really effective, right? So those are the kinds of, of conversations that I think are happening now that mean a lot uh, and financially too, right? Not just for safety. Uh, you know, there's, there, I think what gets people attention is if their, if their home is gonna lose value. In California, a big fight has been, can you still get insurance if you're in a wildfire zone? If you can't get insurance, you can't sell your home. So these are, these are like the levers and the points of debate that I think haven't gotten much attention so far. And they'll get more because, and this is where I'm going to sort of reveal my gloomy side. I don't think we're going to uh, get a handle on emissions anytime soon, at least not to the degree that we, we need to. So I think we're going to find other ways to help people. Uh, and that sort of more pragmatic part of climate policy will be, I think, a bigger focus uh, because it's going to hit us harder every year uh, and, and we're not ready for it. Um, a question um, about um, China's climate policies. Um, so is that, a, is that something that's uh, easy to get a handle on as a reporter 
it's not necessarily your beat, although I know you, I know you did an important piece around uh, climate, um, about flooding models uh, that included uh, what Shanghai and the Shanghai Delta would look like or the Yangtze Delta would look like by 2030 or 2050. Yeah. Um, is, do you have, um, how's New York Times uh, as, a, as an organization and maybe you as a journalist, to the extent that you're trying to figure out what's happening with China climate wise, how, <laughs> how do you find out and uh, um, um, just tell us more about that, that, that realm. I, I, I confess I've done very little reporting on, on China. Uh, we've got, I've got great colleagues who do report on China. I'm aware that there's a data issue, um, but uh, I think there's enough data that you can get trends and you can find out what they're doing on say coal. I mean, China matters a lot for coal as does India. Uh, so um, I, I, I'm reluctant to hazard a guess, um, but I, I yes, you, the questioner is right that getting good data for China is tough. I think there's still enough information uh, to find out what they're doing on emissions that we have some idea. Yeah. Um, a question about, um, so it sounds like you're, you've kind of got a, a view that in terms of the more pragmatic side, in Canada, a bunch of things are, some, some of the things are being done right. Um, uh, you're, you're from Toronto, uh, you come back uh, often. Where do, you, where do you see the um, climate change debate in Canada not being as sophisticated as, as, it, as it is in other countries? Um, I mean, can, like Canada's funny because they've got this inherent dilemma, right? Almost, almost a schizophrenic dilemma, where on the one hand, they, they take climate act, they, t they, they view themselves as environmentally uh, responsible, they, yes. we do, I'm Canadian, uh, but they also wrestle with the oil sands, right? And, and I think my reading of Trudeau's general position on this is somehow magically you can have it both ways. You can both support Alberta's economy and also be a leader on climate change. I, just mathematically, I'm not sure that works. At least I haven't heard that works. And I think, I think Canadians wrestle with that. I think Canadians understandably don't want to just, um, you know, uh, doom Albertans to economic misery. But they also seem unwilling to say, well, since we don't want to hurt Alberta's economy, we're going to have to accept that we were not, we're not going to be leaders on the, on the climate change. So, I, you know, I don't, want to, I don't want to cast aspersions. That's a legitimately hard issue. Um, but uh, I, I sense that, that there's sort of a, a first principles question in Canada that hasn't really been answered, which is how strongly do we feel about this as an issue, cutting emissions, and what are we willing to do to get there? Uh, and I think until that happens, you get sort of weird mixed measures like a carbon pricing mechanism that doesn't seem like it will have real bites uh, and, you know, some, some confused Albertans who are saying, are you for us or are you against us? Uh, so I think that's, that's a tough one for Canada and I, I don't think Canada has nailed that yet. And when you said you ma mathematically, you just mean that uh, support for the oil sands in some way involves increased emissions, no matter how you cut it, no matter how much yeah, better if, you get at pulling if, the oil out of the ground. If you keep on having, even if, I mean, I, I don't have the numbers burning, but, but unless you get pretty significant reductions in oil sands production or really impressive improvements in the way oil sands are produced, I don't know how you get to meaningful reductions nationally of greenhouse gas emissions, right? It's really hard. Uh, so if you can't have both, which one do you want? And I don't think that question has really been answered in Canada yet. Uh, and it, it might be impossible. I don't sense that Canadians are willing to let go of either their self image of environmentally responsible or, or, you know, condemn Alberta to economic turmoil. I think they're trying, I think the view is let's just try to do both. And if we fail at both, that's at least we're trying the right thing. Um, uh, just a follow-up question on Canada. Uh, we hear a lot, there's the pipeline debates are very active in, in Canada. Uh, can you just talk to us again? I know it's not your beat area, but I think something you would be able to add some value to our, our understanding of. Um, how, how are pipeline issues, how are Canadian pipeline issues discussed in the States? What, when, when, people, when, when journalists and politicians talk about Keystone XL pipeline, um, how do they, what, what do they say 
uh, about these Canadian pipelines and and uh, it's, it's maybe a different conversation. Yeah, I mean, certainly when when Keystone XL was in the news, when when was this? Eight years ago? You know, not recently. Uh, that was that it got attention. I can't remember the last time I heard anyone in the U.S. talk about Canadian pipelines. Okay, so it's not really on the radar here. Um, yeah, I, I think I think sort of Canada. Look, as as Canadians probably know, Canada isn't really on the radar in the U.S. and and Canadian pipelines not not really an issue in the U.S. And I'm sorry to report. <laughs> Um, it doesn't sound like you ha you, you said you, you had the more grim, uh, you're, you're, the, you're less hopeful maybe than some around our ability to reduce emissions. Um, and so we're going to have to face, we're going to have to respond. So you've mentioned, you mentioned floods, you mentioned um, uh, stopping the rebuilding uh, around flood, flooded areas. What other kinds of ideas are, are starting to come up in, in your reporting around the kinds of measures we're going to have to take to avert uh, climate change over the long, over the longer run, yeah, I think or, or to deal to deal with the effects rather. I think um, negative emissions. So this idea of removing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. Uh, it's it's, you know, five years ago it was viewed as some sort of a a, a fatal a, a concession that that we had made the wrong decisions and so we shouldn't even talk about it. My sense is that if we that's probably going to be the whole game, right? I don't think we're going to stop emitting CO2 quickly enough to avoid serious consequences. So I think really the technology that matters is probably technology for removing it from the atmosphere. Uh, and uh, at some point, that's going to shift from totally unaffordable to expensive but necessary. So I, I, I look at that as the most important thing to watch. Or one of them. Okay. And is that um, is that a is that an investment? Is that a technology that some folks in the United States are? Uh, sorry, that someone I think on just need to mute their phone if you don't mind. On background, um, uh, both Mr. and I have kids, but I don't think those are our kids. Background. Um, um, uh, is there talk like including in the communities you've covered? Is there interest in having this this carbon? Uh, Carbon sucking technology in their communities. I, I don't think I don't think uh, it's geographically specific. So it's not like in Louisiana, if we just pulled out more CO two over Louisiana, it would help. No. As no. far as I know, um, <laughs> yeah, I think I think it remains a fringe idea that is sort of the focus of some scientists and some technologists for now, and oil companies who want to have license to keep burning CO uh, fossil fuels. Um, but uh, yeah, I think I, the first priority in communities that are hit by this is probably how do we make our homes and communities more resilient and more protected against the effects of natural disasters, uh, and which is as it should be. Uh, so, you know, you hear more conversations about can we spend more money to build seawalls? Can we find ways to make homes in, in uh, fire prone areas fireproof? Uh, and those, you know, there's no question we're going to have to do that more. Uh, I just don't know how much of what is coming we can deal with just through sort of physical resilience. And my sense is not a lot. So, and, and um, if physical resilience uh, is not enough, then the, then the question, and again, you've covered some of this, and we're going to hear more of this. The, the question is, for the community, uh, what's our viability as a community? And do we need to pick up and move elsewhere if we're really in these really highly yeah. exposed places. Can you just talk to us a bit about what the conversation, how you start a conversation like that in a community? Because again, we're going to be potentially seeing more of that and potentially in Canada as well. So two or three years ago, the phrase managed retreats was understood only by, you know, a small contingent of specialists. Uh, it was pretty wacky. And now I think most people who work broadly in this area know what manage retreat is and i think more and more of the public knows what it is and I, my sense is that uh there's there's sort of a, a threshold here if a, a community or a city is hit once by a flood or a storm they still say we're going to build back full stop right if they're hit twice by disasters 
in some sort of close proximity, one year, two years, three years, they suddenly become open to the idea of getting, getting a way to move somewhere else. You find a place that's been hit three times, people don't want to stay. They want to live somewhere else. So I think, I think we'll shift. Unfortunately, I think we're going to shift pretty fast from don't, don't talk to me about leaving my home to get me out of my home. Uh, I think the issue is going to switch to, you know, how does, how does the government support people who want to move and to what degree is it appropriate for them to use taxpayer money to support people who, who want to move? So again, there's a, there's a normative question to these debates that hasn't really come up yet because it's been too far fetched. But I think in the next few years, we'll get to a point where elected officials have to start saying to their, their taxpayers, here's what we owe to people who can't stay where they are. And it's, uh, it's, it's so hard. Uh, and that means including to people and community and, and people in communities that have not been hit two or three times. Yeah, I mean, look, we can't, we can't do that. We can't let everyone get hit two or three times. Hopefully there's some social learning that comes from this. It's, it's a great question. Um, the dilemma is if someone, if a town has only been hit once, they probably don't want to move, right? And you got people who have hit two or three times who are screaming to get money to move. So probably, and this matches my reporting, probably the people who get the money first to move are the ones who want to. And then the people who maybe there's sort of a, a fiscal argument for helping them relocate, but they don't want to relocate, that'll be harder, right? I don't sense any, if it, I, I wrote about this a few weeks ago in the US, there's a federal agency that's been uh, trying to get um, cities to tell their residents that they have to move. Um, and if those cities say no, they, they lose federal funding. And that's really, really hard. So the notion of forcing people to move is that's the hardest, I think the hardest thing there is. Uh, and, and I, you know, my guess is that officials will say, let's help people who want to move first mm -hmm. and then think of what to do with those who are reluctant, but maybe shouldn't live where they are. Um, a gentleman by the name of Chris Ellis, who may be known to you, has uh, written a question. What is a more difficult economy to make the switch? Uh, ex the, an extraction economy or an industrial economy where we make things and those things uh, are related. And Canada and the US, we have both economies. We have both an ex extraction economy and an indus industrial economy. Yeah, I mean, the, the point's been made to me, I, I confess I don't, I don't cover emissions closely enough to know this, but uh, the point's been made that of the different parts of our economy that produce the most greenhouse gas emissions, not all are equally hard or easy to deal with, right? Uh, automobiles, in theory, you could get fast transition to, to electric vehicles without significant sacrifice. Uh, power generation, electric generation, you could get to more renewables pretty fast without much sacrifice. But my sense is that for many industrial activities, you need higher temperatures. It's hard to replace, you know, the, uh, steel, a steel burning furnace or, or, you know, concrete manufacturing with electric power. You need coal, you generally need coal still. Uh, and that is hard. Um, but, you know, the, the optimist in me thinks technology is amazing and will keep on doing amazing things. If your extraction economy is extracting oil, you know, I don't know, I don't really know how good your long-term prognosis is. If in a world where you want to keep temperature increases under two degrees, uh, so you, unless you're burning that oil, unless carbon capture gets way better. I don't, I don't, you know, my sense is that extraction, if the extraction is fossil fuels, you're, you're going to have a tougher time. Um, and, uh, there's a great, uh, energy kind of policy, um, person, um, he, he does many things, but he's he, it, all his interests around around energy, Vaclav Smil from, from Canada who writes, quite uh, well about, about this point. Um, just a question for, uh, uh, for you personally, you, you began, began your career in Canada um, on, on the political side, and, and then you moved to the States and uh, covering US politics and public policy. How was that, as a, uh, how was that switch? And uh, do you find yourself less attached to the stories because you identified as a Canadian at the time? Although I believe you have now made the ultimate switch uh, in that respect. Yeah, I, I, being a Canadian 
you know, like the, the ethos of journalism is you are a dispassionate observer seeking the truth. And being a Canadian in the U.S. is great because, as anyone Canadian knows, you know the U.S. pretty well by the time you get here. You learn it much better once you're here. Uh, but you're always one step removed, right? You're always not quite an American. I, I did, I naturalized two years ago, so I am technically an American, but you're always not quite American if you're from Canada. And so, you know, the issues that you encounter and, and the biases and the sort of the, the baggage, it's not yours, right? You're familiar with it, but it's not yours. And so you're not, you're, you're not, you're perhaps immune somewhat to some of the emotional attachment that can make journalism more complicated. So it's, a, it's been great for me, I think, to approach it as uh, a, an informed but somewhat neutral observer. Uh, and then again, you know, the, what happens in the U.S. matters to everyone. So I, I, you know, I think I probably share the view of most Canadians who wind up in the U.S., which is uh, you're looking at the same stuff, just, just closer up. So I, I, always, I always recommend trying to spend some time in the U.S. to anyone who can, because you think you know the country and understand the country before you get here, but you realize you didn't really. Mm -hmm. um, and, and Americans often um, don't even pretend to try to understand, uh, say they wouldn't even say they would understand uh, Canada. What, right. um, uh, I bet in this beat there, you know, you mentioned that there's uh, a certain amount of pessimism that comes with it, but also there must be activist in tendencies or impulses because the things you care, you cover are so fundamental. And so, and, and you're often, often in conversations with activists. Um, do you see yourself or do you see other uh, environment journalists becoming more activists and or perhaps taking too much of an activist kind of stand when they should be kind of uh, uh, be a bit more measured or uh, impartial? I, I, I can't think of an instance where, certainly I can't think of an instance at the Times or at Bloomberg where I saw a colleague covering something and I thought, hey, you're, you're being too partial. You're, you're letting your views influence your coverage. I think people who, who haven't been journalists might not understand like the whole system is built to prevent that from happening, right? Number one, you wouldn't last long as a journalist if you did that. Number two, your editors wouldn't let you do that. Uh, and number three, your readers wouldn't. So like just, there's all kinds of controls. Um, but also, you know, the issues in climate change are so, are so, are so clear, like it, it almost defies emotionalizing it, right? It's like you, who has to, who, if, if the issue is, well, should, is it important that people don't die in flooding? I mean, you don't have to be an activist. It's just it's like, there's a baseline assumption that we don't want people to die in floods, right? So I think, I don't really know what, what somebody who felt strongly about people not dying in flooding would do differently because they felt strongly about people not dying in flooding. Mm -hmm. um, I, you know, I, I, I'm aware that there's, there's tension in that because the, you know, the most obvious manifestation is, is the Guardian and others saying we should call this a crisis. And if we don't refer to it as the climate crisis, we're sort of, we're imposing a degree of sort of false remove and it's, and we're underplaying it. I don't think that's really, I don't share that concern personally. Uh, I think you, I think the choice of the word is not the important thing. The important thing is, are you constantly looking for news? Uh, and everybody I work with, both at Bloomberg and the Times, they just want to find the news. And there's so much news here uh, that I, I just don't, you know, if you want to be an activist and try and try and get elected officials to do something differently, you would do that, right? I, I, it hasn't been an issue for me, but, but you're right. That's, there's a public concern about journalists imbuing their coverage with their own views. I haven't seen it much, at least not where I've worked. Um, and maybe final question again from the Slido. Um, uh, maybe and maybe two different questions around what you're interested in covering uh, next. So, is there an aspect of the climate COVID intersection that you're keen to kind of dig into? Again, this is going to be uh, something we're going to have to report on or going to have to look at for a while. And then beyond COVID, is there a climate story that you're interested in, in digging your your teeth back into? 
Yeah, I, I, again, I think the COVID climate story remains, or one of them remains, is it's gonna, it's gonna shift people's views, right? If people are worried about their jobs, their health, their mortgage, will, will they, will they uh, be less concerned about what their elected officials promise to do on climate change? Maybe, and to what degree, you, you could set up an argument that says, you know, the window in which we can act before we, we pass two degrees is small, however long it is, if it's five years, 10 years, whatever it is, it, there isn't much time. And you could argue that we're potentially about to lose interest just at the worst time. But like, you know, people made that point before. Uh, this, has been, this has been an urgent issue for many years. So I, I don't know, but I think certainly the way that public opinion changes is important and I'll be, I'll be watching that. Uh, in terms of non, non-COVID stuff, uh, again, my focus remains, how do we change the way we live? How do we change the balance between wanting to live where we want to live and how we want to live, but also realizing that we don't want to be exposed to horrible disasters? And, and what are we willing to give up? Are we willing to give up our home? Are we willing to give up, you know, what kind of car we drive? Uh, I just, you know, are we willing to give up flights? These things are so hard um, and it'll keep on being uh, newsworthy and interesting to see what we do. Um, that is a great way to wrap up. Thank you so much, uh, Christopher Flovell, for uh, joining us today and giving us this really great uh, overview um, on the climate crisis. Sorry, that's the, my word, not your word. Well, you can call it what you want to. And it's and its relationship to COVID and some of the many uh, trends and questions we'll be following in the. Uh, coming months and years. And we hope that uh, you uh, and your family can eventually come back to Toronto for a visit. Uh, and um, and uh, we'll continue to watch your, your coverage in the New York Times. Um, and stay tuned for more Ryerson Leadership Lab uh, engagement on the climate issue. Uh, we, are, uh, we have done a series of uh, in-person leadership trainings that we are going to have to uh, now uh, change modalities for a while. And we look forward to potentially engaging uh, with those of you uh, who have joined us today and others uh, on that work. Uh, cool. Thanks so much, Christopher, and uh, thanks to all of you for joining. Thanks for having me. Take care.